church over here to the side. Thank you so much, our musicians, Shelly and Patricia and Philip. I want to put a plug in for our sound people up there, Craig and Bobby and William. We appreciate their work. We don't want to forget about it every week. These musicians and sound people are practicing and doing things while we're enjoying just the benefits of the music and all the, the sound and so forth, visuals, and we appreciate what they're doing so much. I want you to be turning to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, in the middle of your Bible, the great book of Psalms. We're going to read a couple of verses out of Psalm, uh, the Psalms, one from chapter 19 and a few from some later chapters. And I want to speak to you on this subject, the simple life. The simple life. Psalm 19 and verse number 7 is the first verse we'll read. The Bible says in Psalm 19, 7, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Go to Psalm 116. Just ahead now to Psalm 116. And look with me to verse number 6. Verse number 6 of Psalm 116. We have a verse on there that's wrong. It should be verse 6. The Lord preserveth the simple. I was brought low, and He helped me. Then Psalm 119, just a few pages ahead in your Bibles, if you're turning there. Psalm 119 and verse number 130. Verse number 130. It says about God's word again, the entrance of thy words giveth light, it giveth understanding unto the simple. Let's pray. Dear God and Father, we love you. We're so grateful that you love us and have given us salvation in Jesus Christ. And Lord, in the midst of this very chaotic, busy world, we need to find simplicity. We need to find the simple life. I pray, God, that we can all understand it. And, Lord, we know it's a day-to-day -day work of trying to live it. But, Lord, only through you can we. So we pray that uh, the message today will help us all try to simplify our lives and thus find greater contentment and fulfillment and peace from you. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. Thank you. A little while ago, I read a very intriguing book entitled Simple Church. Simple Church. And it was written by a church ministry and growth expert. And of course, the main lesson of the entire book was for churches and how churches can benefit by making things more simplified than they are in many churches today. But Despite that being the main focus, he also had a lot to say in the introduction of the book about simply how we need to make our lives more simplified. Uh, he says this in the uh, preface of the book. Ironically, he says, people are hungry for simple because the world has become much more complex. The amount of information accessible to us is continually increasing. The ability to interact with the entire world is now possible. Technology is consistently advancing at a rapid pace. The result is a complicated world with complex and busy lives. And in the midst of complexity, people want to find simplicity. They long for it. They seek it, pay for it, even dream of it. Simple is in. <laughs> well, in the same introduction, he uh, lists how some of the most successful companies uh, in the world today have simplified their product or service to become as successful as they are. One example is one that I, myself, and my wife uh, use quite a bit, and that's Southwest Airlines. Based right here in, at Love Field in Dallas, my wife and I, we years ago never even knew about Southwest. We always flew other airlines, but my son-in-law and, and daughter, when they were on uh, their Chick-fil-A work through uh, traveling a lot, they used Southwest a lot, and they told us about it and kept pressing us, you need to try Southwest, you'll love Southwest. And man, we've become real Southwest fans since we went there. And uh, Tom Rainer, the writer of the book, writes and says, Southwest is North America's most successful and profitable airline. It is also the most simple. 
There are no assigned seats, just groups. And the groups are based on the passenger's arrival time. Food is minimal. There are also no hubs. The planes fly the shortest distance between two points. In other words, you won't be stopping in Atlanta or Chicago for another flight. All of this simplicity saves the passenger time and makes the company money. And he, he was right on target with that. Well, when I thought about this idea about not only the simple church, but the simple life. I thought, this is really the purpose of the entire Christian life. Uh, I really think it's kind of encapsulating everything God wanted for us. We are living in such a, a chaotic, psychotic uh, time in history, you might say, not only because we are living in probably the most busy, busy uh, society, but also because we're being pushed so much to think about and act upon things constantly. Whether that be something from our phone or uh, from our family, our workplace or whatever, our society, it's everything in real time. And, and so we're constantly bombarded with things that, that don't make life simple. Uh, so much for all the technology that was originally invented in some ways, of course, to make our lives easier, and it really hasn't. We have, it seems, become the uh, jack of all trades and the master of none, <laughs> is, is what the old saying says. Daniel had it right when in Daniel 12 and verse 4, part of the verse he was predicting the future, and he said, And the end times men shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. Man, that has really, really come to pass. Do you know that even the secular world is discovering that life is too complicated? There's been an explosion, really in the last couple decades at the most, uh, of different fads, all trying to simplify life. One of the biggest movements is called the minimalist movement. I don't know if you've heard about the minimalist movement. Basically, I'll give you some things off one of their main websites. There's a lot of them out there. A lot of people are into this lifestyle now. But it says, minimalism is intentionally living with only the things I really need. Those items that support my purpose. I am removing the distractions of excess possessions so I can focus more on those things that matter most. Now, I'm not saying I agree with everything. This is not per se a Christian movement per se. Now, I think there's probably Christians that are going by this. But what I saw, at least on several of the main websites that you can look up and Google, it's basically uh, more of a secular idea of life, but they go on in the same article, same website to say, our world runs at a feverish pace. We are too hurried, too rushed, too stressed. We work long, passionate hours to pay the bills, but fall deeper into debt every day. We rush from one activity to another, even multitasking along the way, but never seem to get anything done. We remain in constant connection with others through our cell phones, but true life-changing relationships continue to elude us. Becoming a minimalist slows down life and frees us from this modern hysteria of living faster. It offers freedom to disengage. It seeks to keep only the essentials. It aims to remove the frivolous and keep the significant. It values the intentional endeavors that add value to life. One of their main founders, one of the big names in the minimalist movement is a guy named Richard Holloway. And he, he writes on this website, quote, Simplicity, clarity, singleness. These are the attributes that give our lives power and vividness and joy. He wasn't talking about singleness and marriage. He means single-focused. Now, again, I'm not saying I agree with everything in that movement and it's not necessarily a Christian movement, but I think there is some principles that these minimalist people have, uh, have achieved, have caught on to. Now, here's the question. Is it even possible in this age to live a simple life? And is it a good thing? Which should we even strive to simplify our lives? Well, it seems from our text, at least, there in the book of Psalms that we read, that there is something about being a simple-minded person in this sense, a, sim a single-focused a, a, a person who is simply driven by one thing and not a bunch of things. I do need to add a disclaimer, by the way, a little bit of a, uh, a parenthetical here. Um, the word simple, as used in our King James Version, is used two different ways. I don't want you to get tripped up on this. There's times when the word simple is really referring to an ignorant person. 
Like in Proverbs 7, in verse 7, it says this about a man who's led into adultery. It says, And and I beheld among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. It calls him a simple one. Now that's not the same exactly as what I read from the Psalms. There's two different ways to use it. I'm talking about the simple person who finds simplicity in life and not all the chaos. And so I think it's true as we look into the Bible that God meant for the Christian life to be simple. And here's why. Because God wants us to enjoy the Christian life. He wants us to uh, find peace and and contentment, less clutter, less stress. The Christian life was never meant to be a big puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle that we could never put together. Do you know when Paul is writing about the Christian life, he uses the word simplicity several times. In 2 Corinthians 11.3, he says, But I fear lest by any means... As the serpent beguiled Eve through the, his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now let me say that when he talks about the simplicity of the Christian and the Christian life, he's not saying that you're never going to read or hear of anything in the Christian life that is hard to understand, that it means you'll be able to totally understand and totally get everything. He's not saying that. He's saying it was never meant to be confusing. It was never meant to be so chaotic, so hysterical, that you and I couldn't enjoy the Christian life. I find it really interesting that in the book of Colossians, a couple books later, Paul doesn't use the word simplicity, but he, he talks about the principle. He's talking about these people who at the church at Colossae were creating a a Christianity with a bunch of do's and don'ts and this and that and and just a, a theological ball of wax that couldn't be unwound. He says in Colossians 2, 6, to begin this thought, he says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him. I love that. You know, how, you know how simple it was when you first came to Christ? You didn't know all kinds of different theolo- theology, and you didn't, you didn't know what was going to happen the rest of your Christian life, of course. You just came to Christ, and you hope you did. If you're saved, you did. You repented of your sins. You put your faith in Christ, and you were overjoyed by the fact that God changed your life, right? You were so happy about that. And you began kind of a, a clean slate, a new beginning. And I love how he says, As you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. And then the rest of that chapter, he he simply goes through a bunch of discussions about how people were trying to do the opposite. They were trying to make the, the Christian life a bunch of different things it was never meant to be. So he keeps warning them. Like in verse 4, he says, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. Verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments or principles of the world, and not after Christ. Notice how he's adding all this in. He says, Don't let people trick you, beguile you, deceive you. He said in verse 18, Let no man beguile you of your reward. And then in verse 20, he says, Wherefore, if ye be dead with Christ from the philosophies, rudiments of the world, why as though living in the world are ye subject to ordinances, uh, man-made ideas and doctrines, taste not, touch not, handle not, which are all to perish with the using after the commandments and doctrines of men. You see what he's getting at? He's saying, don't let people complicate the Christian life with all these things. That's what religion does. Man-made things are always too complicated. Now, here's the question. How can we simplify the Christian life? Is it even possible? Well, I think the only way we can do it is make the answer to the simple life simple. (laughs) And I want to simplify it today by giving you one word, just one word. To answer, how can we live a simple life? And that is one of the most important words in all of life, and all of the Bible. The word love. The word love. You know, love is one of the greatest concepts, the greatest ideas that was ever created by God. God is love, the Bible says. And if we can learn the the depths of what love really means and experiencing love, we can simplify our lives around this idea of love. 
1 Corinthians 13, 13, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity, love. James 2, verse 8, listen to what James says about love. He says, If ye fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. And then, of course, one of the most famous passages, I go back to the Gospel of Matthew, where Jesus was asked in a a certain uh, episode where he was preaching and teaching at the temple. Someone said, what's the greatest law? In verse uh, number 36, it says, Master, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Just like James just quoted. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. So, if the simple life can only be lived by love, well, I think we have to start by giving at least a working definition of love. Now, (laughs) that may be easier said than done. There's people that have written and, and sang and and did artwork and music on the subject of love throughout the history of mankind. So how am I going to, you know, whittle it down to a couple of points? Well, let me, just, let me just try to make love as a response, or how do we live it out? Because love is an action word. It's not a passive word, okay? So let me break down love into, into four ways we show love. Because to me, I don't think you could really even talk about love without an explanation of what it looks like. Four ways, and we're going to apply these to the five different persons that are things that we ought to love to have a simple life. First of all, love is to think about something or someone. If you love someone, you think about them. Paul wrote in Philippians 4 and 8, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things things. What did Paul mean by that? Think on these things means to to love them, to concentrate on them. The second thing we can say, and I'm defining love still, not, we had not got into the five, we look at five people or things you ought to love, but I'm just trying to define love. First, it's who you think about or what you think about. Secondly, who or what you spend time doing or time with. Hey, love is spelled T-I-M-E, isn't it? We all know that. We ought to know it. If, if you're going to have a good marriage uh, or any marriage at all, you better know that. Love is spelled T-I-M-E. You know, it's a biblical principle. Whatever you love, you spend time with. Look at some of the proverb. Proverb 29, 15 about parenting. It says, the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. What, what happened there? Left to himself means his parents didn't spend any time with him. Didn't give him the proper attention that child needed. Thirdly, thing about love, not only to think about, to spend time with, to do things for. That's a definition of love. Whatever you love, whoever you love, you do things for that person, for that cause, right? I think no better passage could explain this is what Paul says to a husband, how he ought to love his wife in Ephesians 5, 28, but then he, he describes it as how a man loves himself. And none of us love anybody else more than ourselves. That's a great way to explain it. He says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. See, there's the comparison. He says, guys, you want to know how much you're supposed to love your wife? Love your wife like you love yourself, your own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Every one of us nourishes and takes care of our body. He says, hey, if you love something, you love your wife in this instance, you'll do things for her. Fourthly, and we're just defining love to think about, to spend time with, to do things for, to hold dear, to hold dear. This is kind of the most emotional of the definitions, but I think it's still a good one. You know, what what it means to hold something dear, that means it's precious to you, it's valuable, it's special. Paul said this about a church he wrote to in 1 Thessalonians 2.8. 
Paul said about this church. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. <laughs> Paul says, we'd have given our, whole, our soul for you, everything for you, because you were dear to us. So now, with that definition of love in mind, this is how we define it, this is how it's carried out. Let's try to simplify the entire Christian life. And I have to add this little disclaimer. This cannot be for a non-Christian because a non-Christian won't be able to even love these things properly. See, before you come to Christ, not only do you not have a life, you don't even understand life, but you sure don't understand love. Because love comes from God, and only a Christian can be loved by God and express love like they should to others. So I have to say that the prerequisite for a simple life is a Savior. Jesus Christ. But with that in mind now, for all of us that are saved here today and Christians, let me, let me try to work this out with you because I think having a simple life is <laughs> something I think we all desire. Even the world I showed you desires it. How are we going to find it? Well, five people or persons or things, you might call them, that we need to love in the four ways I told you. We'll look at each one of them the same way. We're going to talk about each one, how you think about, how you spend time with, how you do things for, how you hold dear. First of all, and of course first on the list has to be this, love God. Love God. You know what Jesus said? When he was asked what's the greatest commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now let's put that into practice. Remember the four ways we define love? Here's how you know if you're loving God. Now, none of these, by the way, do we love perfectly. And none of them are like you start it and you never have to do it again. It's an ongoing experience. Love, you just can't say to your spouse, I love you, honey. That, that, that covers us for the rest of our marriage, doesn't it? <laughs> no. You gotta, it's got to be new every day. It's renewed. And all these ways we love are renewed every day. So don't misunderstand that when I say about loving God. First of all, we think about God. How often do you and I think about God every day? Is He on our minds? What you love, you think about. How about spending time with God? How much time do you spend with God? In His Word, in prayer, meditating, singing, just having your thoughts on Him. You know, in the, in the uh, Ten Commandments, the first two commandments have to do with our relationship with God. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make anything any graven image. That's how important God was. He's at the top of the list. That's why I didn't take Jesus any time at all when that man asked him, what's the greatest law in the commandments? Bam, it came right out of Jesus' mouth, I bet, without any hesitation. Love the Lord thy God. And man, he put it, he put it pretty high, didn't he? He put the benchmark pretty high. With all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's everything. See, we, we think about Him, we spend time with Him. How, how about doing things for God? What are we doing for God? See, you serve what you love. What are we doing for God? God calls us to service. He really does. It's not, no relationship ever makes it if it's just gimme, give gimme, give take, take, take. It's give, 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 give. See? It's how we simplify our lives. I'm, I'm going to love God. I've got to put Him first and then to hold Him dear. Oh, is God dear to you? I hope He is. I want God to be dear to me. I, I, want, I want every day to be special, thinking how dear God is, and one day I'm going to see Him face to face in the person of Christ, my God, my Savior. I want Him to be dear. So I tell you, if I can concentrate on these areas, I'm going to make my life simpler, right? Secondly, not only are we called to love God if we're going to have our lives simplified, number two, and, 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 by the way, these are in somewhat of an order for a purpose, especially with God, of course. And these other four, you know, we put them in an order of importance just because of their relationship to us. But the second one is love your family. Love your family. Yes, of course this has to be on the list. You want to simplify your life? Love your, your spouse. Love your children. Try to love your extended family. That's not always easy. Well, even your immediate family sometimes are to love, but we're supposed to love our families. Uh, God says to the husband, husbands, love your wives. He even tells the wives in Titus 2, wives, love your husband, love your children. I mean, this is, a, this is a no-brainer. Now, we love them by thinking about them. Hey, you know, if you're married, you think about your spouse. 
That's who's most important to you. That's till death do you part. That's the vow you made. Your spouse ought to be the single most important human being in your life. Remember, God made Adam and Eve before he made any children, any siblings, any relatives. Adam and Eve, husband and wife, that is the most important relationship. I'd rather be with my wife than anybody else in this world, physically speaking, humanly speaking. Now, I love other people. I spend time with other people. I have other family. I love my kids. I love my grandkids to death, but I love my wife most. I spend time with her. You spend time with your, your spouse. This idea of, uh, and I'll speak for husbands, we're talking on, in our Bible study on Zoom about the Christian manhood, and we've been talking about different things about men, and we're talking about how men need to love their wives, spend time with their wives. You know, a guy that comes home and plops down on the, on the couch or the uh, recliner with a remote in his hand and sits and does nothing all night, <laughs> that's not a husband. That's a live-in resident of the house. <laughs> you just have a, a squatter. You have a renter. <laughs> Somebody's paying to live there, but it's not really a part of the family. We're supposed to spend time with our spouse, our children. We do things for them. That's how we love. We do things. What are you doing for your family? Your family's not just there to give for you and, and, to, and for you to take, take, take. Here it is again. You know, we are to be giving as a, as a husband, as a wife, as, as a child, as a parent. Right? Families are giving thing. The best families are families that give to one another. They love each other, doing stuff for each other, and they hold each other dear. Oh, boy, that's a great one. Man, who you love, you hold dear. Man, there's nobody more important than my family. You know, guys, you'll, you'll agree with this when I say this example. You know, somebody could come up to me and curse me to my face, and, and, and not that I'd love it, but you know, I'd get over it. But if somebody ever comes up and says something to my wife when I'm with her, or even when I'm not with her, that's not going to go over well. Or my kids, or try to harm my grandchildren, <laughs> that ain't going to go well. Right? Those, are, those things are dear. Those things are precious. Those are the most valuable human beings in my life. I'm going to live a simple life by saying, I'm going to love my family with all my heart. So you love God. You love your family. Thirdly, you love your church. You love your church. <laughs> I mean, these aren't deep, are they? I'm trying to talk about the simple life, so it's not going to be deep. I'm not going to tell you anything new today, but I am going to hopefully make you think about is this where you put your concentration? Like we've already seen, and I talked about it in the introduction, there's all kinds of bombardment of things outside trying to get you off this simple life. I think it's the devil's ploy, basically, because if he can get you off focusing on these things, you're going to be running rabbit trails and distracted on all this other stuff. Life being simple. Love God, love your family, love your church. Oh, I love the church. I love this church. I love every church I've been. I haven't had a bad church experience ever. Now, I've had some experiences that weren't <laughs> the best experiences in church, but I've never had a bad church experience. I, I run into people all the time. It's so sad. They tell me they've had this bad experience or this bad thing happened. You know, if you love something, I, I'll tell you something about when you really love something, you won't have as many bad experiences if you have any because you'll have the right mindset about it. Love covers the multitude of what? Sins. If love covers a multitude of sins, there could be some sins that happen right before your nose. But if you love that thing, you'll be willing to forgive. You'll be willing to go on. It won't bother you. You won't give up on it. Love your church. Think about your church. How often do you think about your church? I hope you don't just think about it on Sunday morning. I've got to set that alarm, get up there, go to that church this Sunday. Man. No, think about it through the week. Think about it every day. Now, I'm a pastor. I think about church. I eat, drink, sleep. Whatever, the church. I wake up thinking about the church. I dream about the church. I'm always thinking about the church. I always have. Because I've been in ministry for 36, 7 years almost now. But I love the church. I think about it. How about spending time with your church? <laughs> Remember, we're talking about how you really show love. You know, when you're only here once a week for an hour, it's hard to love you a lot. <laughs> i got to tell you, it's a lot easier to love you when you're here more. The more you're on something that you love, the more you show love and receive love from that thing or that individual. Spend time with your church. We do things together, services, fellowships, times we get together. You're thinking about your church during the week. How about doing things for? Of course, that's a great way. 
that you show your love for your church. You're doing things for your church. You know why sometimes people in church work, and I've seen this so many times over the years, they get... They get, um, what's the word? They get frazzled. They get frustrated. They get upset. Sometimes they leave, but sometimes they don't, or they just stick around and not do much after that because they, they feel like they're getting burned out or they're getting overworked, okay? Now, I understand burnout. Believe me, I've dealt with burnout. But you know, you know what? I've always tried to keep this in mind when I'm tired and I think, man, I've got to do this again or this happens again. What am I doing it for? I'm doing it for God. For my family, yes, but I'm doing it for the, the Lord's church. I love my church. I do things for the Lord's church. If I have to do some task that I'm called on to do that I might wish somebody else was doing, man, what, I, mean, I could grumble about it. Oh, man, why don't they do that? Where's so-and-so? Now, I can get in the flesh like all of us can. You, you can get like that. I can get like that. But you know what will keep you from getting like that? I'm doing this for the Lord. This is His church. I'm doing it for him. He's keeping the record. Do I hold it dear? Oh, yes. The church ought to be dear. It ought to be dear to every one of us. When the church is dear to you, that means it's so valuable. It's so precious. It's so special. Like God is. Like your family is. See see how these things go together? These are, they connect so beautifully. Because, man, this is how I simplify my life. These are things I'm going to put my my focus on. I'm going to put all my eggs in that basket. I'm going to put those things in my basket and hold on to that basket. Loving God, love my family, love the church. Number four, love your country. Love your country. Yeah, do you know the Bible teaches nationalism? It does. Look at Israel. You think they didn't love their country? You haven't read your Old Testament well. (laughs) They really love their country. God's not against that. It's not that you're being bigoted or prejudiced to love your country. It doesn't mean you shouldn't love others. Of course, that's going to be our last point. But loving your country. Man, I'll tell you, I think about this often. I often sit there in my prayer time or just throughout my day. I'll be doing some meditating. God, I'm so grateful you let me be born in America. America's got tons of problems. Man, it's not what it used to be, but it's still better in a lot of places in the world. Thank you, Lord, you let me be an American. Thank you, you let me be born in this country and have the freedoms that we enjoy and to be blessed with a higher standard of living than really anywhere else in the world, to be able to do whatever we want. You know, I got on a plane yesterday from California, uh, 1,500 miles or more away, jumped on a plane, flew in a few hours, got in a car, drove home, and I was home in the evening back to my own house. 50, 100 years ago, they never thought about that. Most people 100 years ago, uh, even in our own country, (laughs) <laughs> lived and died within a 10, 15 mile radius of where they were born. Now, but look at America. We, we have all these things. I think about America all the time. I love American history. Man, I, I studied. I loved it. Listen to it. I listen to podcasts. A lot of the podcasts I listen to are American history. I listen to one about all the presidential elections here a while back. Man, I learned a lot of stuff. You know, not every one of those presidents I would agree with, but you know what? I, I like to learn how they got in office and what was going on in our country. You know, before you could be a citizen of our country, there's a hundred, I don't know if it's still the same, it was, maybe, I hope. To be a citizen of the United States, you have to answer a hundred question, a hundred questions in a questionnaire format to be given your citizenship. I don't know what grade you have to get per se, I, I didn't find that out, but I still found out that, yeah, that's a good thing. Why? Because if you want to be a citizen of America, you got to at least know some things about America. You ought to appreciate it. I think we ought to love our country. And I would say this for anybody, no matter where they're at. Every Christian in this world. You're a Christian in China, you love your country, you pray for your country. You're a, you're a Christian in Africa, you're a Christian in South America, you're a Christian in Europe or in Asia. Doesn't matter. You think about your country. You spend time with your country and the things that show your love. Hey, we got an election coming up, as you know, at the end of this year. Every Christian not a vote. That's part of I'm spending my time for my country. I pay my taxes. I'm giving, you know, I don't always like how much I have to pay uh, taxes, but I, I pay my taxes. I'm not revolting against the government against that. These conspiratorial people who call themselves Christians, they're out to lunch, I'm telling you. That's not biblical. We're to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, the things that are God's unto God's. How about do things for your country? Yeah, I think it's a good thing to be a good citizen, Right? Pray for your country, to support your country. As long as the country, and whenever the country's not uh, trying to pass things that are against God, we ought to support it. We support our country, support the freedoms, we support the process, the government, the political uh, status, and so on, uh, structure. 
We ought to do that. We hold it dear. Hey, you, you find out. Remember, remember when 9-11 happened? Man, there was flags flying everywhere. There were people singing God bless America everywhere in the country. Why do we have to have 9-11 to do that? That's sad, isn't it? And it kind of wore off in a few months, I think. No, we ought to be thankful for our country. You know, I, I, I really have a hard time understanding people who come to this country and they hate this country. Why'd you come here then? <laughs> this, country, this country's not perfect. There's no nation that's perfect. But I think God would have us, if we're going to live this simple life, we've got to love our country. We've got to care about it. It's got to be dear to us, spend time with it, do things for it, think about it. That's part of living a simple life. Well, the final one, number five, love others. Love others. This is just a, this is the biggest category of the five I know. You say, wow, well, that's a big one. It is, but it's really a mentality, isn't it? It's just, it's a mindset. And this is why I said non-Christians can't live by such a mindset. They never will. To love others comes from God. God so loved the world, so we so love the world. Loving others. There's no such thing as racism or prejudice. There's no such thing as people who are less than us. We are all one. We are created by God. We are in the human family. God has made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell in the face of the earth. That's what the Bible teaches, right? We're to love everyone. We're to think about the world. You know why I love missions? What's so exciting about missions, it keeps us thinking about the whole world. You know, we read these letters and we pray over the cards in Sunday school out here in the adult class. And, and we're, we're giving to missions. We're thinking about our missions. We hear from them. We have them in occasionally. Let them preach to us. Tell us how their works are going. Why do we do that? Because we're thinking about them. We're thinking about the world. I can't contact every person in the world. Of course, you can't either. But we can have somewhat of a connection. We can build a bridge to these people through missions. So we're thinking about others. We're spending time with others. Now, I'm going outside of your immediate family and even, even your church. Spend time with your neighbors. Spend time with people you meet. Uh, just being a good person who does things for others. Man, I'll tell you, what a witness that is. What a, what a blessing that is to, to reach out to people. The ladies are going through this book study. This is a tremendous study. And I noticed one of the commonalities of all these stories of these conversions that they're reading about is that someone did something special for a person. Nearly every time, it brought them to Christ. Brought them to the gospel. Uh, somebody just reached out, got out of their regular routine, sacrificed a little time, money, whatever, effort, to do something for someone else. And so that's how you love others. And then you hold people dear. Our world, the unsaved world, they don't seem to hold each other dear anymore. We have so much division. There's a statistic. We were talking about it. I don't know if, who it was I was talking about, the statistic too, but this is pretty sad. It kind of falls back to the country one earlier, but this applies. There was a statistic. People were asked with the present Russia-Ukraine conflict, if a country invaded America, what would you do? And it was like almost a half or something near a half, I think it was like 40% maybe, said they'd leave the country. <laughs> I thought, well, you're a faithful American, aren't you? And how about others? You'd leave the country and leave them to their own devices? What, what, if, what if all of us thought that way? How about World War II? Let's put that back in perspective. Let's say that everybody in those countries that Hitler invaded and, and the Japanese invaded and so on, it, what if all of them just thought, I'm getting out of here? What if countries like America and Britain and, and France and even Russia that was an ally, what if we'd all thought that way? Hey, it's not my problem. We'd be living under Nazism still today. Some totalitarian government that could have controlled the whole world. Thank God it's not. But you see, that's what I mean by we have to love others. We have to hold dear other people, care about other people. I love to work out at, at Mission Arlington when I go out there because you meet so many people from various parts of the world. I get to talk to them, and sometimes there's a language barrier. It's, it's a little frustrating on my part. I don't blame them. I blame me. But uh, I like to be able to, to communicate with them and just to see them and, and be a part of a ministry that's helping them. That's what we're to do. See, this is all about sim simplifying our lives. Let me end with this. Do you want your life to be more simple? Well, if you do, you've got to concentrate on these areas. And there could be some others I could have brought up. You'll, you'll have your own. Maybe there's a few you can add to that list. But I'm saying these 
are the big areas of life for a Christian. That Jesus said you have to love them. Love God and all these others, I think, the same way. With all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, I want to end by one reminder. You notice one person that was not on the list of the five things you should love? Yourself. (laughs) Do you know the world would have had me on the top of the list? Or somewhere close. No, life becomes way more complicated when it's all about me. Because me is never satisfied. You can't be on the list. I see those I am second. I I see those all the time. It's a ministry. And I'm not saying they're not doing any good. But I'll tell you, on my list, they're not even on the top five. They shouldn't be. I shouldn't even be on the top five of the list. God, my family, my church, my country, and others. And as we love all of these with all our hearts and we concentrate on that, man, love is tough. It's not easy to do. It doesn't just happen automatically. But I'm focused on that every day. You know, through my prayers, through my inter- interactions and connections with people. This is what I love. This is what I want to... And, and my life could be simple. You know, yeah, there's parts of that. I mean, there's making a living and all these other things. And yeah, there's some things you got to do along the way. I'm not trying to be naive about this idea. But still, I'm telling you, people are looking for a simple life. And you can find it first through Jesus Christ and then loving the things God says that you and I should love. Let's bow our heads. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. The simple life. I find that whenever my life gets chaotic and really gets complicated, it's not going good. I bet you can say the same. It's the more simple I make my life, the more I tend to enjoy it. It's it's a lot easier to focus on like these things I mentioned that all the other distractions. So today, I'll just throw out an invitation to you that do you want the simple life? Do you want a simpler life? Maybe that's a better way to put it, simpler. I don't know if we can ever say we're living a perfectly simple life. Only God knows, and I don't know how we could judge that completely, but I would say I definitely want to live a simpler life. When I see how chaotic some people live and how frustrated and angry they are, and they're just frazzled, and they're, they're stressed out, and they have physical problems brought on by stress, the whole world like that. God wants us to enjoy life, right? So our invitation will be this. Do you want the simple life? Ask God to help you love the main things you ought to love, to really focus on these things. And then, of course, if there's anyone here that's never yet been saved, you've never had a time in your life where you came to Jesus Christ as a sinner, humbling yourself before Him, admitting your sin and saying, Lord, I've messed up my life. I've lived selfishly. I haven't lived to love others. I've loved myself. If you'll come to Him and apologize, yeah, ask Him to forgive you. Say, Lord, I'm sorry that I've lived a selfish, wicked life. I'm repenting. I'm turning away from that life. I'm giving that up. I don't want to continue that way. I'm turning to you and asking you to forgive me and to save me. And I believe you will. And I love you, Lord, and I want to follow you. That's what really being a Christian is about. The minute you make that decision, the very moment in time that you make that decision to repent and believe on Christ, He will do a miracle in your heart called the new birth. You'll be born into God's family. We always invite anyone who's here in our service that's never been born again to be saved, to be born again today. Well, I'll begin a prayer to just ask God to kind of bring everything together I've talked about with you. And that if there's one here that needs to be saved, this will be your time to think about that. And those that are saved, we'll think about this simple life. Lord God in heaven, we thank you for the privilege it is to know you and to know that we can find peace, we can find contentment, we can find this simplicity in Christ. And Lord, I pray for every Christian, every church member, that we're going through so much and there's so much happening in our church, our world, our country, our personal lives, our family, our work. We know that life's complicated, but Lord, you can make it less complicated. We'll just focus on this simple task of loving these things that are most important and giving to others and putting them before ourselves. 
Lord, speak to every heart now in this invitation. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?